Thank you for joining us for the class this morning, whether you are uh, joining us for our premiere at 9.30 on Sunday or at a later time. We're glad that you have this interest and hope that it is an interesting and uh, profitable experience for you. We have been looking at uh, the development of Christian theology from the beginning, trying to understand our roots, where we are, where we came from, and uh, understand uh, why people believe what they do today. And last week, we looked at three different systems, interpretations of salvation. One, by St. Augustine, we are saved by grace. And in reaction to that, Pelagius, we are saved by our own choices. And then a modification from John Cassian, who said, yes, saved by grace and saved by our own choices out of an island of righteousness that is preserved, a rather a middle ground, though closer to St. Augustine. Today, we're going to consider uh, some of the teachings of St. Augustine in further depth. And the reason for that is simply this. There is no single theologian after the Apostle Paul who had a greater influence on the development of Christian theology, especially in the West, than St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo. And for that reason, he deserves a little more in-depth treatment. And we're going to spend the next two weeks looking at uh, St. Augustine's contribution. So uh, let us begin. The theology of St. Augustine, and notice below I say his polemic works. I mean by that, his opposition to what he considered to be false teaching. And the point of that is that when there's false teaching and, and Christian theologians are forced to confront that and think about that, out of that uh, catalyst, uh, Christian doctrine is refined. Now, Augustine, born 354, died 430. I call him the theologian of grace, the greatest of the Western fathers, without doubt, and the most influential early theologian. And of course, I said earlier, I think he is the greatest uh, theologian in the Western world after the Apostle Paul. In uh, preparing for this lesson today, I think I, I really learned some things that I hadn't known before, particularly about the person of this man. You know, it's one thing to understand their doctrinal teachings. It's another to come to understand them personally and the way they operated. And so as I went through some commentaries and uh, an encyclopedia on St. Augustine that I have and other sources, here's some things that, that I noticed. Um, First of all, reviewing from last week, uh, and we know about his life because of his confessions, the confessions of virtually an autobiography, which takes the form of a prayer addressed to God about his conversion. But he explains his, his youth, uh, and he says, if I could use this expression, he had wild, <laughs> wild youth. Uh, his father was pagan, his mother, Monica, was a Christian who wanted him tried to persuade him to accept Christ and continued to pray for him with tears, passionately, every day for many years. But Augustine talks about the fact that he uh, had really low morals as a youth. He stole some pears from a neighbor. He said for no good reason, he didn't need them. He didn't eat them. He just wanted to do it to, to show that he could. And then, of course, he got involved with a woman, uh, and he had a child by that woman, Ariodatus. And so his, uh, his background was that of um, questionable morality, and he had difficulty freeing himself from it. Of course, he couldn't really free himself. He needed help, and he found that out. But as his spiritual uh, interest developed, he became involved with the Manichaeans, and when the Manichaeans could not answer the questions that he asked, he turned to Platonism, particularly Neoplatonism, and he found that they were much closer to an understanding of God than were the Manichaeans. And he always had an affinity for the Platonists, 
but he did not commit himself fully to Platonism and he broke away from it. Now, in the meantime, he got an education as a rhetor. That's a typical Roman education of rhetoric that would qualify him to be a teacher, uh, to be a secretary, uh, to go into law or to go into politics, a number of avenues open. He had an opportunity for a job in Milan when Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, was looking for a secretary, uh, an assistant to help him. He didn't expect to get hired because he was uh, younger than the other applicants, but he did. And he sees that as an expression of the providence of God. He, of course, would attend Ambrose's lectures. Ambrose, like uh, many bishops, would be teaching younger clerics uh, in uh, what would be similar to a seminary. And so as he heard Ambrose's lectures, he said, I tried to filter out the, what he was saying, the, the content of it, and, and focus on his style, focus on the way he put his lectures together, his vocabulary, how he presented it, because he wanted to learn himself. However, it, it just couldn't be helped that eventually he began to listen to what Ambrose said. I use this expression, he began to learn by osmosis. And finally, he became convinced, even after uh, he, he found himself uh, talking to Ambrose and asking him questions about theology, and he, he became convinced of the truth of Christianity. But he was still bound to his past, to his wild past. And he couldn't find the strength in and of himself to make that break. Until one day in Milan, when he was walking in the courtyard of his lodgings with his friend Alepius and talking to him about this problem that he was facing and how it was just tearing him apart. And they sat down on a bench in the garden and they were, had a Bible there, we were looking at it, and he began to burst into tears. He, and he was ashamed that Alepius would see him crying, so he got up and went away uh, and walked away, and, and he heard this sound of a child saying, tole, lege, tole, lege, which means pick it up and read. And he thought that was really a voice from God, the providence of God, to tell him to pick up the Bible and read it. He ran back to the bench, sat down next to Olypius, and picked up the Bible where they had left off reading it in Romans 13, which said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And he said that gave him the strength to make that break with his past and commit his life to Christ. Subsequently, he was baptized along with Olypius and his son, Adiodatus, and his mother, Monica, who had prayed all these years for the conversion of her son, was present, although she died shortly after. She did live long enough to see him baptized. Now, here's his major polemic works uh, against the Manichaeans once he left them against the Arians, against the Pelagians, and he was affirming against them a salvation by grace and the fallenness of man. It is so important to understand the fall in order to understand the necessity of salvation by grace. And so he emphasized that. Also against the Donatists, remember the Donatists were those who believed that people who denied Christ under persecution uh, could not be restored except for, with uh, severe penance, and if they were pastors, they couldn't get their pulpits back, and, and if they went back and, and did, and their followers came back, they needed to be rebaptized. Uh, they were also called traditores because they handed over the scriptures to uh, the authorities, especially under Diocletian, and we get our word traitors from that. So he wrote against the Donatists, and I mentioned earlier that he did leave Platonism. He always had an, uh, an appreciation for the Platonists, but he did oppose many of their doctrines, and he wrote against Celsus, who was an arch enemy of Christianity, and uh, particularly he was objecting to the dualism. Dualism means they saw a good God and a bad God with equal power. And uh, I said earlier, I began to appreciate the, the person of Augustine as I, I did this study for today's lesson. Uh, 
uh, he was brought up in North Africa. Remember, North Africa is very strict in its theology, very legalistic. And he left North Africa to go to Italy to take the job in Milan. And he found a very different theological climate there. And he had to adapt to that different climate, a much uh, broader uh, climate, a much more inclusive and not quite so tight <laughs> as was North Africa. And when he approached people with whom he differed, and I noticed this about him, and this is true always with, with Augustus, Augustine, he approached people with respect. He showed respect for these people, even though he differed with them, and he was reserved. He, he didn't come on strong uh, in his personality. I have to respect that. He didn't attack people. He dealt with their doctrines. John Calvin said the same thing in reference to himself, that he didn't write against any person. However, when Augustine debated, he was very strong, and he continued to study all his life. He continued to study, to analyze passages, to analyze arguments, to evaluate them, to compare, and he revised, and he was certainly willing to change when he realized he was wrong. As a matter of fact, he, he wrote retractions of doctrines that he once had believed that he now was convinced was wrong. And so uh, he developed, he evolved as a theologian in an honest way, always uh, dealing with doctrines and not with personalities. And uh, as is true with him, as, with, as with, with all, most of his writing, most of his thinking was the result of being challenged by doctrines that he considered to be false. Now let's take a look quickly at the Manichaeans. Uh, he knew the Manichaeans because he had been involved with them for a decade. And so he can be rather authoritative, although it is true uh, that he was only at the lower level. He was not among the uh, elect, as they call themselves. He was, if you look at the very last point in this slide, he was only a hearer and knew only the basic catechism. But the Manichaeans, which were a combination of many different religions, Christianity and Zoroastrianism and Gnosticism and, and Platonism, but they did speak of Jesus. And he thought that was uh, perhaps, maybe they were a version of Christianity, but they were not, and he found out so. But they did offer a cogent explanation for the problem of good and evil, and then he was looking for that. And he offered, they offered salvation without a change in lifestyle. And at that point in St. Augustine's life, that was an appealing option. And they emphasized reason over authoritarianism, and he'd seen a lot of authoritarianism in North Africa. So all of this appealed to him. Uh, but when he left, because they couldn't answer his questions, the Manichaean priests could not, uh, he targeted them first. And one of the reasons was just simply to show and to illustrate to everyone, I am no longer a Manichae. So there were prolific number of writings against Manichaeism throughout his whole career. And the main refutation point with St. Augustine deals with this dualism idea. He said, it is absurd to hold God vulnerable. They didn't see a God who was sovereign. They saw a force of evil, a Satan, equally matched in power with God, and therefore God's purposes could be frustrated, and, and he found that to be absurd. So in the process of dealing with the Manichaeans, he had to address the divine nature of God, the nature of good and evil, the relation of God to the world, the human composition, and the process of redemption. In other words, he had to address the Manichaean teaching at all levels thoroughly. And he did that. Who are the Manichaeans today? Well, we don't have people calling themselves Manichaeans, but we do have sects that involve non-Christian groups in their community. They are Christian, but they include non-Christians as well. I'm, I think of the B'nai B'rith, for instance. And there are sects that do not hold to basic Christian teaching. They feel uh, quite free 
uh, to depart from uh, that which is established as necessary to believe among Christians, a consensus, what we all often call orthodox Christianity, little o. I would think of the unity movement there. And there are people today who, like the Manichaeans, attribute the powers to the devil and to demons that really make them equal with God, that dualistic idea. And we have sects today that are exclusive, ascetic, and judgmental. The Cathars of the Middle Ages, for instance, uh, were in line with the Manichaean thought. Then there's this writing against the Donatists, those who did not believe in taking the lapsed back in without uh, heavy penance. Now, this is a controversy that was rampant in his own homeland of Africa. He grew up with it, but he didn't pay that much attention to it because he was disinterested in this excessive literalism, authoritarianism in his own home country and rather happy to get away from it. And he went to Italy uh, and, and encountered a much, as I said, a much uh, more inclusive, much broader Christian environment. But when he returned to North Africa, remember he became a bishop in the North African city of Hippo. When he went back to North Africa, he encountered the Donatists and took a special note of them because all the time he'd been in Italy, he had been away from them. He, they are not strong in Italy and he comes back and now he realizes he needed to deal with them. Now, the Donatists, the root of their idea is they want to represent the pure church. They want the church to be absolutely pure and they have a problem with admitting sinners in any way. People are supposed to just be free of that. So uh, he will write many times against the Donatists in, in debate and in books and pamphlets beginning in 392. And notice this point, this is always true with St. Augustine, he refined his arguments over the years as he thought, as he examined, as he considered, he will refine his arguments, he will change. But uh, his basic uh, beliefs regarding the Donatists always remains the same. That is, uh, people who have sinned can be forgiven. And he particularly focused on their policy of re-baptism, a tract called the Baptismo, uh, which he did not believe in. So he accused the Donatists of being a sect. They claimed they were the one true church. Augustine pointed out that they were not representative of the church universally. And therefore, they could not be the one true church, which is universal. Now, in regard to the administration of sacraments, remember the Donatists taught, among other things, that uh, pastors who had lapsed uh, could not perform the sacraments. Otherwise, their sacraments would be invalid, would be null and void. And uh, Augustine argued, you can't know the soul of the pastor. You can't know his heart. How can you say that his sacraments are invalid? And therefore, he doesn't tie the validity of sacraments to the character of the administrator. And even pointed out inconsistencies with some of their own excommunicated pastors, because they allowed some of their favorites to come back in and to administer sacraments. A man named Maximian, for instance, and uh, he pointed that out. That's just hypocrisy. Now, and in throughout this uh, study today, I'm putting the arguments of his opponents in blue and his own arguments in red. The Donatists argued that as Catholics, little c Catholics, that is the universal church, as the Catholics accepted their baptism, and they did not accept Catholic baptism, that meant that they were the true church because they had the one baptism. Now, that's a little convoluted logic but they're building on the fact of one baptism. And they said, if the Catholics accept their own baptism and our baptism, that's two baptisms. And we accept only one baptism and that makes us the true church. Uh, that is, uh, I think, a rather absurd ar argument. The Council of Carthage in 411 intended to end this controversy once and for all. And it was a council that had and contained debate much debate on both sides. They did not end the controversy. It did not end in North Africa until the Muslim invasion. 
uh, of the seventh century. Now, the Donatists like to pull Cyprian in on their side. Uh, Cyprian is pretty strict, but Cyprian loved unity and he couldn't accept the idea of sectarianism. And after uh, he had dealt with the Donatists, he will turn to the Pelagians and eventually to his great work, The City of God. Here is a picture of Donatus who died about 355. Who are the Donatus today? Well, I think denominations that attempt a perfect church who believe in that idea of sinless perfection and exclude sinners and deny forgiveness and, and groups that demand rebaptism and sects that claim that they alone are the true church. We can find all of these characteristics in various denominations today. And of course, he wrote against the Arians. Remember the controversy that led to the Council of Nicaea in 325 and to the Council of Constantinople in 381. The Arians following Arius who believed that Christ was created. He's not divine, he's not uh, the same essence as the Father. So he will write against the Arians in, in several of his works. Many of his works that are not specifically directed to them, but he will bring up this matter. And of course, it comes up every time he mentions that Christ is indeed uh, co-eternal with the Father. Remember that uh, the people who believed the Arian doctrine were believed in homo eusios, which means having Christ had a substance similar to the Father, but not the same and the Homoousians, which believed they had the same essence as the Father. Now, this controversy was much more prevalent in the West than in the East, because especially after Theodosius came to the throne, uh, they outlawed the Arians, because in the East, the emperor had firm control over the church. Now, of course, his writings, for the most part, are reactionary to their false doctrine, but in the process of writing against the Arians, that gave him the opportunity to develop his Trinitarian theology, the theology of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of one God in three persons. Now, I'm posting here in the blue some of the arguments that the Arians would give, and each of these arguments, if you take them and look at them, you can see why they would tend to support the Arian argument. But of course, there is an explanation or each of them that would uh, not be in line with the idea of Christ being a created being. First Corinthians 15, 28, key passage. When all things are subjected to him and the son himself, uh, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in submission, subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So they say, well, God is, Christ is subject to the father. And that means he was created. No, it doesn't. And Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This is the kinos doctrine. Kinos is the word for empty. And, and they say, how, if he empties himself of his divinity, then he's not God. Well, he didn't empty himself of his divinity. He emptied himself of his standing of equality with God. And then John 5, 19, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. And then John 14, 28, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. And they say, there you have it. The Father is greater than I. And of course, Christ is talking about his human nature, which he had. He took the human nature fully. Uh, and sometimes he is talking about that uh, exclusively, but it does not mean, never means that he ceased to be God. It doesn't mean that he wasn't God. And so, one of the prime answers that St. Augustine will give, and those who are homoians, who believe in the homoousius doctrine, that, that Christ is of the same substance as the Father, uh, 
we'll use the passage in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so he wrote a number of works just on Arianism, which you see there. And uh, it, it was simply an opportunity for him to reflect and to think deeply and to develop his own understanding of Christian theology when he was challenged by the Arian doctrines. Here's Arius, died 250, or born 250, died 336. He was, of course, from North Africa. Who are the Arians today? Well, we have denominations that deny the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ, like the Unitarians and others. And we have groups that, like the Arians, will select certain proof texts to support their views. And they do not consider the context of those passages, nor do they consider the whole testimony of Scripture and allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. We have people who use the Arian methodology in theology, as well as those who actually believe the doctrine of Christ not being the true Son of God and not being eternal with the Father. Now let's come to Pelagius. This is a controversy that went on for a long time, and as it did, there's a change in emphasis on the part of St. Augustine, and you'll notice that as we go along. But even though he will change emphasis, his doctrine is always consistent, and he writes on the matter when the occasion demanded it. When circumstances came up, uh, he will write, and defend what he believes to be true, and that is our salvation is by grace. But the first person who really challenged St. Augustine was Celestius of Carthage, who was bishop there. And uh, he thought that the doctrine of original sin was simply optional. In other words, it wasn't a fixed and true doctrine. And when one as some people have said, and I think it's a good little expression, well, you may, if you miss the fall, you miss it all, because everything is really predicated on the fall. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, um, answering the inquiries of Simpliacus of Milan, he quoted this passage, and it's significant. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You think about that. What makes you different? Who sees anything different? Who do you have? What do you have you have not received? Your faith, everything, your salvation, your regeneration, your sanctification, all from God. If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And thus, Augustine would say the beginning of faith itself is a gift from God. We don't decide we're going to believe and generate our own faith. Now, this came out, these ideas came out in his dealing with Celestius, who was there in Carthage. He was in North Africa also, of course, so he knows him well. And this is before Pelagius' teaching even arrived on the scene. Augustine wrote this in the context of that uh, controversy. In the solution of this problem, I long struggled for the free choice of the human will, but the grace of God conquered. Now, at first, and here we see this progression in emphasis, at first, uh, St. Augustine regarded the Pelagians as erring brothers, not heretics. And Remember their concern. Pelagius was very concerned about morality, about Christian living, about piety. And he applauded them for their zeal in Christian conduct. But he cautioned them that can lead to pride and to a sense of elitism. In other words, if, if you are simply the product of your free will choices and God has nothing to do with it, then if you see yourself as excelling in your piety and morality, that could develop in your heart pride and you would have a sense of being superior to others. And, and so Augustine said, be careful. I, I congratulate you on this emphasis on Christian living, but be careful. 
And he wrote a very kind letter to Pelagius when he found out about Pelagius. And he spoke of him very respectfully. And here again is that attribute of St. Augustine that, that I think we would admire. Uh, he didn't attack the person of Pelagius. Uh, so he really, at this point, was trying to avoid a controversy with Pelagius, whom he really regarded very highly. This is Celestius of Carthage, the first person uh, with whom St. Augustine had to deal on this issue. I don't know his exact dates. I don't know whether he actually lived to be 99 or not, but that's what I found. And of course, here's Pelagius, uh, born around 354 and died about 418, the monk from Britain, who was the proponent of the free will doctrine. And again, uh, his, the, the, the idea that gives birth to his theology is his great concern about morality and his chagrin at seeing Christians not living as they should. And so he concluded, salvation is a matter of correct choices of good works to emphasize their responsibility. Now, in the controversy with Celestius, and I want to say at this point uh, that I received a copy of a paper from my good friend, actually a member of the family, uh, Michael Hines, who is a fellow church historian, and he had written a uh, paper in his graduate work on this controversy with Pelagius and Celestius and St. Augustine. And I appreciate that because I gained insights that I didn't have before. And Mike does uh, watch this class and I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, it felt like I learned a little bit more about the personalities of these people. Now, Celestius argued that it could be possible for one to avoid sin by the power of his created nature. Simply saying, you and I, by just being humans, can avoid sin. And he said, if sin cannot be avoided by the human nature, then it's not free. And if it's not free, it can't be culpable. It can't be guilty. And if sin is something that cannot be avoided, then it's not sin. It's the idea, again, God doesn't command that which we cannot do. And if it can be avoided, Celestius argued, Human beings can be without sin, and here is what he said, for neither reason nor justice allows us to call that sin which cannot in any way be avoided. You see, it comes down to this question, can I avoid sin just by myself? And St. Augustine replied that we could avoid sin only if our human nature is healed by the grace of God. Calestius came back and asked if the human nature is inclined more to sin than to virtue, how can that human nature have come from God who is good? And St. Augustine answered that the human race had fallen into sin by a misuse of free choice because St. Augustine believed that Adam was born without any sin but he misused that free choice and what was once freedom has now become necessity. And we can become free again only by the grace of Christ. In other words, our freedom is lost because of Adam's sin and it now becomes necessary to look to the grace of Christ. And he quotes John 8, Jesus said, if any man commits sin, he becomes the slave of sin. And he says, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So the only way to be free of sin is through the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, St. Augustine's argument is often uh, posed with these Latin uh, words, expressions. He says, Adam was posse non peccare, which in Latin means Adam was able not to sin. Absolutely. He was able not to sin of his own nature that God gave him, which was a good nature. God looked upon his nature and said it was very good, but he chose to misuse that freedom. And fallen man after Adam was non posse non peccare, not able not to sin. And he said that's the condition we are in until we come to Christ. And redeemed man again becomes, like Adam, 
Posse non peccari, able not to sin. And that's our situation today as Christians. We have that ability, although we still sin, because there is residual um, elements of the old nature in us. And in glory, man is non posse peccari, not able to sin at all. Now, as we contrast these two systems, St. Augustine and his associates believed in what we call monergistic salvation. That means salvation is worked. The ergistic is from the word energy, meaning work. Salvation is accomplished, is worked by one, and that one is God. God, uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one God. And Pelagius and his associates believed in what we call synergistic salvation. It's worked by many. Sin means with. That is, man and God work together to accomplish salvation. Now, another key player in this was Julian, the Bishop of Eclanum, which is in Italy. And he was the object of Augustine's greatest attacks on Pelagian teachings. And from Mr. Hines, I, I picked up this uh, interesting point. Uh, he pointed out that Julian was, he called the, the whisperer. He was the undercover worker who sought by innuendo to question the leaders attacking the doctrines. In other words, I see him as something very sly, sneaking around quietly. However, Celestius had great ability, great polemic ability as a lawyer. And, uh, and Mike says they made a team. And so these are the people that Augustine is dealing with, this combination uh, of Celestius and Julian. Now, in summing up their teaching, they would teach, each soul is created pure and has perfect freedom to do good or evil as Adam had. And if sin is a man's own, it's voluntary. And if it's voluntary, it can be avoided. Now, Augustine taught that the Christian life of good works is the result of a genuine faith, which of course is a gift of God. And even those good works are produced uh, through the influence of grace and the Holy Spirit. But Pelagius, and of course, Celestius and Julian, taught that the Christian life, the active life, is something that was to be added to faith by employing one's moral faculties, which were inherent in the human nature and strengthened by Christ. So you take the faith and you add to it the works on your own, strengthened by Christ. Because remember, Pelagius always said, grace is available if you want it, if you call upon it. Here's Julian, born about 386, died in 455. Now, this uh, came to the attention of the Council of Carthage. And would you look to the very last point before we go through it? Uh, it's in the black print. Uh, Mr. Hines pointed out in his paper that there were actually in all seven synods and councils dealing with this question. And one of them was the Council of Carthage. Now, in the blue, you are seeing here uh, the charges that were brought against Celestius at the Council of Carthage. Uh, th this is what, uh, as they interpret it, the council says Celestius was teaching. One, Adam would have died even if he had not sinned. Two, the sin of Adam injured himself alone and not all mankind. Three, newborn children are in the same condition in which Adam was before the fall. Four, it is not true that because of the death and sin of Adam, all mankind die. Neither is it true that because of Christ's resurrection, all men rise again. Five, the law leads to heaven as well as the gospel. And six, even before the coming of Christ, there were men who were entirely without sin. Now, what did the Synod of Carthage in 418 decide? in refutation of those charges. One, Adam was not created subject to death. In other words, Adam could have lived forever had he not sinned. That is the promise of God. 
the tree of life, was there. Infants are to be baptized for the remission of sins. Three, grace not only gives remission of sins, but aid that we sin no more. Four, grace gives knowledge, inspiration, and desire to perform, to perform our required duty. Notice the council is not saying that we don't live the Christian life and do the works, but the council is saying that it is necessary to have divine grace to do it correctly and to avoid sin. And thus it sums up in number five, without the grace of God, we can do no good thing. And six, the statement, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, should not be said out of humility, but because it is true for all of us. And in the Lord's Prayer, the saints pray, forgive us our trespasses, not only for others, but also for themselves. And the saints pray, forgive us our trespasses, not out of humility, but because they have sinned. Now, we talked last week about John Cassian and what we call semi-Pelagianism. What about John Cassian? There is no known contact between St. Augustine and John Cassian. Now, these semi-Pelagian doctrines centered in South France and the leaders of that movement were known as were uh, Faustus of Rie and Caesarius of Arles. Their position was, like so many, uh, a reaction to a radical view of predestination, to what is called an intemperate view of predestination. We would might call that today um, the far right Catholics, the uh, hyper Calvinists uh, who completely discard human responsibility and they don't even preach the gospel. That is an extreme view. And, and this extreme view seems to have been circulated and Cassian and these people were reacting against that and seeking a middle ground. But I think there was a fear of elitism on their side as well. Remember, St. Augustine cautioned against the the elitism, if you pride yourself in your good works. But on the other hand, if you take this extreme view and you have defined that you are among the elect, you might begin to think of being elite and better than others and uh, forget what Paul said, who made you different? You didn't make yourself different. But there is that fear of elitism as well that drove John Cassian and Faustus and Caesarius to this middle position, which says essentially everything St. Augustine said is true, but there is this island of righteousness, what Cassian said, the seeds of righteousness preserved within man out of which he can make the choice. Now, all the councils affirm man cannot choose good without divine grace. And of course, Cassian and the semi-Pelagianists agreed in that. But Faustus of Rie balanced that with his idea of an infusion of grace at creation. In other words, uh, every soul is infused with this, this island of righteousness that is grace that enables them to come to Christ. Now, there were 25 different uh, pronouncements of the Council of Orange in 529. Please notice this is 100 years after St. Augustine's life. And I just selected one as an example of the decrees of the Council of Orange, which actually found Cassian guilty of heresy, but they still were somewhat moderate in their position. So please notice, if anyone says that not only the increase of faith, but also its beginning and the very desire for faith by which we believe in him who justifies the ungodly and comes to the regeneration of holy baptism. If anyone says that this belongs to us by nature and not by a gift of grace, that is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, amending our will and turning it from unbelief to faith and from godliness, godlessness to godliness, it is proof that he is opposed to the teaching of the apostles for blessed Paul says, I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion 
at the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1, 6. And again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For those who state that the faith by which we believe in God is natural, make all who are separated from the church of Christ by definition in some pager believers. And here is John Cashin. Again, his view, the some seeds of goodness implanted by the kindness of the creator, which however must be quickened by the assistance of grace. Very close to St. Augustine, but with that modification. Now, in conclusion, uh, the Pelagians considered that Augustine's view took away their freedom and made man a puppet. I think I've heard that argument, but that wasn't Augustine's view. Augustine came back with this. We only become, only by being enslaved to God could one escape being a slave to sin. And that, of course, comes from Romans 6 when Paul said uh, that when we uh, are baptized, we become slaves of righteousness and we are freed from being slaves of sin. Now, again, that refinement of his emphasis, the more he learned about Pelagius, the more suspicious he became of him and finally abandoned the more cautious approach as he did in his Incaridium ad Laurentium in 421, which is a summary of his theology and especially focusing on original sin and predestination. And he taught that sin tr was transmitted through concupiscence in the sexual act, even though marriage is holy. But there's enough concupiscence remaining in the flesh to transmit the sin. And guilt is cleansed by baptism. And Julian of Eclanum, of course, who opposed Augustine, equated Augustine's views more with those of the Manichaeans and said that original sin is no more than Manichaean doctrine uh, of dualism to which Augustine answered. Uh, and he distinguished, he said, the Manichaeans believe that evil is a substance opposed to good. And he did not believe that. And I want us to look, to look at this more next week. Augustine believed that evil is a lack of being. It's a defect. It is a consequence of the misuse of free will. It's not a, a substance in and of itself. Therefore, Augustine taught post-fall man is incapable of doing good and can never merit grace by exercising his own volition. Now, although he wrote much about against the Pelagius and against uh, Celestius and Julian, all of these works will constitute a rather coherent explanation of his beliefs. Who are Pelagians today? Well, of course, denominations who deny original sin and who teach that Adam's sin affected only him and who deny out of hand predestination and who claim that man can do anything that God requires quite on his own. To them, to Pelagians, grace is, extends only to, one, God created the world, two, God sent Christ, three, God gave us a Bible, four, God gave us the gift of free will. Stop, the rest is left up to you. Now, again, semi-Pelagianism is not Pelagianism. Now, uh, I said the importance of Augustine is so great, we need to look a little more into his teaching. Today, we've looked at his polemic work, that is his opposition to teachings that he considered false. Next week, I want us to look at his great work the city of God. And this is in perhaps the more uh, positive approach, what he really believed uh, put together almost as a systematic theology. And it is tremendous in its effect, both on Catholics and Protestants for different reasons, but both hold him in very high regard. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, hope you'll be back with us next week. I hope it's been profitable for you. And I certainly hope that God is, has been glorified through our teaching.